joins us from, it looks like, Lake Geneva, Switzerland, on the Harbor One hotline this morning. Mike, hello. How are you? I'm doing just fine, thank you. I'm here. Uh, yeah, you're right. I'm on the shores of Lake Geneva. Everybody's strolling around. It's about 75 degrees. It's beautiful. Looking up at the Alps. Oh, and now I have to talk to you people. It's <laughs> a beautiful backdrop. What is the current? What season is it currently in in Switzerland? Is it spring or is yes. it? It is. Yeah, it's just like what you're just like at. here. Is it just like here? It's below yeah. the hemisphere that has the opposite seasons. Curtis, like Argentina. I didn't, Curtis, I didn't graduate from high school. You think I know like where the hemispheres are? I mean, give me a break. It's, a, it's called the equator. Uh, yeah. Isn't it? Isn't it hotter near the equator? Is that how that works? Yes, yeah, that's okay. exactly how it works. <laughs> Uh, well, listen, while you were gone, I don't know if you've been paying attention or not, but we had a lively discussion. <laughs> we had a lively discussion yesterday about the, about Coach Cassidy, and uh, I had pointed out yesterday that uh, post-game on, on Tuesday night, he called out Charlie Coyle and said, essentially, Charlie Coyle refuses to shoot the puck at the net. And uh, there are guys there, and we need him to shoot the puck at the net. I'm paraphrasing. Uh, and Wiggy yesterday was bothered by that, as as were some. I We've gone back and forth, whether it's DeBrusque or others, with regard to his propensity to do this. Are, are you still uh, on the side that he needs to stop calling guys out publicly? I, I am. I, I really don't think it accomplishes much. And there are, we've talked about this. There's a better approach to changing a player's behavior than using the media to adjust his game. And uh, Charlie Coyle's had a pretty good season. He's been a pretty steady and forceful player and fits in perfectly on the third line, one of the top third line players. And should he shoot the puck more? Sure he should. But speak to him. Tell him. You know, pull him aside. Tell him how much of a difference it makes when he shoots the puck and when you shoot the puck, everybody turns around and looks for it, tries to tries to figure out where it's going. And that means for a split second, people are open. They, they can move freely for a second. And so it's a tool, not only a chance to score a goal, but it's a tool to, you know, disrupt the opposition. But to have to do it in a public way, to me, is, and he's done it before, and maybe because things aren't going quite as well as they had, he's reverting to this. But I think it's, I think it's a mistake. And from his perspective, why do you think he's doing that? Scheim was suggesting this morning in his lead that he is he may be feeling some sort of heat or something, and his go-to reaction is to call players out. I, I think I don't think he's feeling the heat. I don't think he should be feeling the heat. You know, it's been a it's been a tough little run here. Got the injury list is getting extensive. They're only what three weeks away from the start of the playoffs. There are uh, playoff positions in play here. Um, and the fact that they can't decide on the number one goalie right now, the fact that they can't get Postonok back on the ice, the fact that three defensemen are, are sitting on the ninth floor, um, those things add to some pressure. But of all people uh, in an organization, the coach has to deal with pressure in the appropriate fashion. They, they, he needs to steer the ship, even though it's, you know, murky and rough waters. Mike, you brought up the goalie situation. Is it possible, or can you in the playoffs have a kind of goalie by game, or should there be one guy come the playoffs and say, okay, you're the number one and you're the guy we're riding, or is it? can you be a coach that can say, all right, well, we don't know who our goalie's going to be night to night in the playoffs? Well, right now it looks that's like that's the way they're heading. I mean, Swayman's having a little bit of a swale in his game, and uh, you know, but it's tough to it's tough to get good reads now with the number. You know, you're talking about the power play going oh for whatever now sixteen or something, but their best power play player has been out for the last bunch of games, and may it maybe it wasn't going quite as well without it, with, with him there, but still, it's a really difficult time. That's why the injury thing is probably the most significant factor in all of this, because you want to find your rhythm going into the playoffs. You want to find a, 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 a feel-good place, for lack of a better phrase. And right now, they're, they're having trouble because they're, they're missing so many key components. And, you know, when I guess 
you could say that Olmark has played pretty well lately, but you want, you know, it looked like we were trending towards Swayman for the longest time. And I'd like to think they can figure it out that there's going to be a number one goaltender, but not be afraid to make a change when it has to be. I'd rather ride a number one goalie than play it game to game. Mm-hmm. I think the goalies like that better, but uh, right now, um, it could be that crapshoot. You will, you allude to the power play and and uh, David Pasternak being out. Are you worried about that injury because he's not back yet? I would be. Yeah, listen. If you got your, your best goal scorer and your premium power play guy on the shelf, yeah, I'm worried about it. It's been what's it been about ten days? Um, yeah. Cassidy's kind of indicated as not too too concerned about the long term, but I refer back to my earlier comment where you want to get the guys into a rhythm heading into the playoffs where they feel good about themselves, they feel healthy, and and one of the key aspects of feeling good about yourself going into the playoffs is having a power play that's that's humming. Mike, when it comes to Brandon Carlo, uh, Cassidy didn't really give any indication on uh, his situation at the moment, but do you think it's more of them being cautious because he's dealt with so many concussion issues in the past, or do you think that this is something that uh, he'll be back no matter what? We shouldn't even worry about it. It's impossible to answer that question. They, they, you get so little information from teams now regarding injuries that you can't make an assessment. But listen, however many of these guys have, have been dinged up, you know, however much you'd like to be in a rhythm going into the playoffs, you you want to be healthy. And if it takes another week or 10 days or two weeks or right up until the drop of the playoff block, you got to do it because, because you don't want anybody – operating at less than 100%, and that includes Carlo. Well, and you need him when it comes to the PK. I mean, I, he, he's a giant factor when it comes to that. He is, and so is so, so is Lindholm going to be, needing up big minutes. But, you know, we're, we're in a situation where these guys go down. You don't know the exact nature of the injury. Uh, you don't know whether it's a groin, whether it's a – sprained knee or something you just get and the best you're going to get is upper body lower body so you know we're groping in the dark here to determine whether this guy will be back or whether it's something to be super concerned about or not what what's your expectation for this team in the playoffs and and what should ours be how, how far do you think we should expect them to get well they were running they were running the table pretty good for a while and and then it seems like this happens to them during the course of this year that they, they hit a little bit of a wall. In this case, it's understandable because of the injury factor. But, listen, I don't know where they're going to wind up. And it's, it's so close with Pittsburgh, Tampa, Boston. You know, the Rangers aren't completely out of reach for, for trying to leapfrog them. So I don't know who they're going to wind up playing right now. But I think you could expect, you could hope for a first-round win. And if you got more than that, I think you'd be happy. Mike, there's nine. Maybe, days. maybe not happy, but satisfied. Satisfied with a first round win. Hmm. Okay, Mike. There's nine games left. If if you're Cassidy in this situation, and you kind of feel like you you're you're you don't know where you're going with your goalie, what do you think we see him do with the goalie situation with these nine games? Do you, do you think he splits them to figure out who's the guy they're going to go with, or do you think he says, "All right, Swayman gets most of the games." You know, it, I, again, it looked like Swayman was going to be the guy, and now things have seemed to have unraveled for him. But I would, I would still, I would still mix him up for another week and a half, two weeks, and maybe even tell him, guys, I got to find out who's going to be the starting goaltender come playoff time. You guys are in competition. I know you're good buddies. You love to give each other hugs after the game, but I need to find out which one of you guys is going to be my guy. And or maybe he decides to do the flip flop thing, which I don't like. Um, I'd rather have a steady, solid hand. And for me, oh, given the, the whole scope of the season, Swayman would be that guy. But I'd still want him fresh, and I want him rested and, and ready to go playoff time. So I would I would roll the goaltenders for another ten days or so, and then maybe make a decision that I'm going to try to go with one or the other uh, leading into the playoffs. And give him a little extra work to make sure he's sharp. Mike, I believe if not for philosophical differences, 
there would be there would have been no Jerry York at Boston College. Now that he has announced his retirement, any interest in giving that a go again? Uh, no, no. I've been there and almost done that. <laughs> 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 As I told you, know, I told you, he owes me. He's in the Hall of Fame because of me. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you th that was like you took that job and then you didn't like the size of the office or mm. something. Was that what it was? No, it was, it was a real schmozzle. They had, uh, you know, I was supposed to have eight scholarships to distribute in my first year. And unfortunately, the previous coach had dispensed scholarships for the next four years. <laughs> in the first first two weeks of my tenure, first month of my tenure, I had a steady stream of uh, a steady stream of kids and parents come in with letters that said they were operating under the impression. And, and here's the proof that they were going to have scholarships. And it just got to be too much, and um, so I took a I took a pass on the position. So I went from making a good buck as assistant general manager to Harry Sinden to making a less buck but secure job at BC and to making nothing at all. <laughs> really good decision by my. It's all about <laughs> recruiting, anyways. Yeah, I mean, go you Don't have yeah. no scholarships in trouble. But, hey, listen, but I, I have two sons who are finishing up at BC. No hard feelings. <laughs> All right. They got um, their money's worth. You had one before you Yeah, I just because I wanted to get Mike's input on going back to Cassidy in the in the dressing room and how the players might feel about him. Because through our talks about whether or not he's lost this locker room, whether or not uh, he, he's worried about his job being in jeopardy, we went back to the David Krejci comment he made about moving pasta around. And to me... I, I had a hard time even finding one soundbite of any player currently that's spoken, you know, glowingly about Cassidy. Have you ever been in a situation where you feel like the respect is gone between the team and the coach? And, and how do you kind of reel that in, especially going into such a crucial part of the season and then into the playoffs? If you're a coach, you don't do it by calling people out publicly. I mean, that's the time of the year where you have to be extraordinarily judicious with your comments to the media. And you have to make sure that you get into the space of people and, and your players, make sure they trust you, trust you. They, they know that you're honest with them and that there are repercussions to not following the, the party line. Uh, and do I have experience with that? Yeah, we had a guy that followed Don Cherry. It was Fred Creighton. And probably anybody that followed Don Cherry was going to have a hard time, but he lost. Uh, he was so different than, than Don. He didn't talk as much. He didn't have as much fun. He didn't, you know, the guys weren't as committed and the, the, the instructions weren't as specific as they were with Don. And you could tell that by the end of the year that we were going nowhere fast. And actually Harry made a, Harry Sinden made a change and he came behind the bench and we had a pretty good run. We eventually lost to the uh, the Islanders in a pretty tough battle, but um, at least it gave us a fighting chance. I don't think the Bruins are anywhere near this now. If I remember correctly, you lost the team when you sent LB to Maine. Is that correct? <laughs> <laughs> we lost LB when we sent him to Maine. <laughs> 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 All right, Mike, enjoy Switzerland, and we will talk to you next week. All right? All right. Take care, guys.